Verse number 35. John 11, 35. That in one hand, Hebrews 5, 7 in the other. John 11, 35. And then Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse 7. In John eleven thirty five, 35, the scripture says, Jesus wept. And somebody said that's the shortest verse in the Bible. And it's one of the most powerful. Only two words, but it does convey a message. Jesus wept. In Hebrews 5 and verse number 7, the scripture says, Who in the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. And then Luke chapter number 19 verse 41. Luke 19 41. Luke 19 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Father, bless the reading of your word now. In thy holy, blessed, righteous name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. What I've read to you tonight is three cases, three individual cases, where the Lord Jesus Christ wept. And obviously, by the fact and virtue of the fact that he wept, we're looking at a complete man. Not a uh, hybrid, not a ottoman, and not a machine, not a robot, but a man, the God-man. And if you'll notice three times in the New Testament, at Lazarus' grave, John eleven thirty five, 35, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Hebrews 5, 7, and over Jerusalem, Luke nineteen forty one, the Lord Jesus Christ weeps. In each case, there's a specific reason for the weeping. His tension is focused upon something that literally moves the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's given humanity something that uh, I'm not saying it's unique to us. Uh, it may be, but I know for one thing, it certainly does reveal the uh, condition of the heart. That's the tear that flows from the eyes of the individuals. They tell us that tears are necessary, at least why it's necessary to keep your eyeball lubricated. Because if your eyeball is not lubricated, you can get in trouble. Dry eye is a big problem. And tears that come forth from the tear ducts in your eye uh, does help lubricate the eye, but it's not solely for that. It comes forth because it's the fountain of the heart. It begins to reveal what's down in the soul. And when the Lord Jesus Christ wept at the grave of Lazarus, he didn't weep because the sense that Lazarus was dead. He wept because he felt the loss. He needed to feel the loss. In order to be your high priest at the right hand of the Father and minister the grace of God to you by the power of the Holy Spirit, he needs to feel. And he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and on all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I've stood by the casket, folks, down through the years many, 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 many times. And I've seen people come by the casket, take their last look at a mortal frame lying inside that casket. And some of them look me in the eye and I can see the tears rolling down their face. Some choke back tears. They, they don't want to be seen crying. Others just kind of stiffen themselves and they go on out and they walk by the body. But the tear flows from the heart because the heart's involved in what's going on. The heart's connected. That body is not your loved one, you know that. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But it is the earthly house of this tabernacle, we know that. And it bears the resemblance of a soul. And the soul is gone from a body that has been suffering. There's no more suffering on the face of that individual. The suffering on the face of an individual is the product of the soul that resides in that body. That's exactly right. Think about what I just said to you. The soul and the body manifest itself through the facial features of what you see. This is why an individual has said so many times when you look at the dead body, why well, they're at peace. It's just like they're asleep, even if they've suffered with cancer or they've had all kinds of problems. When you look at that body, they're no longer suffering. The soul's gone. So the tears flow. The Lord Jesus Christ felt real loss. He felt real sorrow because he loved Lazarus. And you know as well as I do that this was uh, in his own mind. He intended to wait until Lazarus was dead before he got there so that he could prove a point. And, of course, the point was, I am the resurrection and the life. 
I don't raise the dead. I am the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection is a person, folks. Salvation is a person. It's all about a person. When you remove the Lord Jesus Christ from it, there is no resurrection. The scripture says, The hour is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. And they that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. To be specific with you tonight, the dead don't really rise. The Bible says the earth shall cast out the dead. They're already dead. They don't come back to life. They're simply a dead one standing in death. And all they have is, all they'll ever know is the second death. There's no life for them. But they'll be standing in judgment, dead, to be cast off into eternal damnation without God. There's no life outside of Christ. Amen. Well, the Lord, you can't live without the Lord Jesus Christ. He is life. And Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Amen. But in Hebrews chapter number 5, we find him crying again. And this gets a little more complicated, as I've said to you time and time again. Because Hebrews chapter number 5 is when the wrath of God begins to unfold upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And his soul, his soul is beginning to feel wave after wave after wave of the holy wrath of Almighty God. He never feared the cross, folks. The Bible said for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. These people over there in Israel, in, over in Iraq and Iran and uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia and Syria and all this place over there, while well, they'll quickly blow themselves to pieces, smiling in your face as they detonate a suicide bomb, and uh, all of them with uh, full belief that they're going off into, into paradise and there'll be 70 virgins up there waiting for them. Uh, no, they're not, they don't fear death. Most of them don't fear death. They've been brainwashed, and they're looking forward to dying, and they're going to take as many with them as they can. And you're going to see it right here in this country. It's coming right here to America. Get ready. It'll be right in your streets, your malls, in this nation. But in any event, for someone to come along and say the Lord Jesus Christ was quaking and fearing death is to lay something on him that's not true. No, what he saw was far worse than death. What he looked into was much deeper than death, much, much deeper than death. And he cried out to the only one that was able to save him, reached down to where he was going to have to go and pull him back up out of that and raise him up to the right hand of the Father. He cast himself completely in his life upon God. He cast himself completely in his death upon God. He gave him everything that he could possibly give him, and he was heard. He feared because he, he heard. He, he was heard because he feared, and he feared, and God Almighty uh, raised him up. So the Bible says here that with strong crying and tears, you know, here's something to be thankful for tonight. You'll never have to see that. The old timers said so many times, you go back and read their stuff 150, 200 years ago when they talk about the passion of Christ and what he went through. They all seem to come to the same conclusion about something. They all seem to have the same perspective. Apparently, they thought a little deeper into things than we do today. And here's what they say. You'll never know. We'll never know in this world how deep was his sorrow, how terrible his suffering until we get to the promised land in the presence of the Lord. So when you get to Hebrews 5, you need to take it with the grace of God and say, Lord Jesus, there's no way that my human mind can comprehend what you faced. But he cried. He wept. Thank God I won't have to weep. Amen. He took my hell so I won't have to go there. Amen. In Luke chapter number 19, verse 41, he weeps again. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Now look at verse number 42, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. How oft, he said, I would have gathered thee. Here is not, here's not one, this is not one who takes pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. There's no gloating and glory in the soul of God over a soul that rejects him and goes off into the pit. He loves mankind. Man. He's weeping over people who've rejected him. You hear him again when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yes. Islam doesn't preach love. There's not another religion out there on the face of the earth that preaches that kind of love. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. Nobody ever loved you like Jesus. You'll never know love, the love of God without Jesus. 
the most blessed one that ever walked the face of the earth, that had a heart. The very people that he loved were the ones who were going to nail him on the tree. He wept over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He stood there and looked at that beautiful city because Jerusalem is unique. There's not another place like it on the earth. The first time I saw Jerusalem, folks, I, had, I couldn't wait until I got around the corner on that bus and saw that city and it took my breath away. I went over to the Mount of Olives and stood on the crowd looking across the Kidron Valley and saw Jerusalem, the eastern gate, and looked at the walls of Suleiman, the so-called magnificent. I looked at that beautiful old city, ancient city, and I marveled at what I was looking at. Folks, I, you've never seen anything like it in your life, I'm telling you. You have never seen anything like it. And he stood somewhere, no doubt, where he could get a view of Jerusalem, and he wept over it. He wept over the religion that was so blind to the truth. He wept over the people who were so ignorant to the truth. And he wept over the city itself because it had so much, so much potential. The city of peace, Jerusalem, the city of the great king, the city of David, the city of Solomon, the city that had rejected their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wept. Do you think God Almighty rejoices when a soul rejects him and goes to the pit? No, he doesn't. Do you think Satan rejoices when a soul goes to the pit? You better believe he does. You better believe it. He mocks, no doubt, and taunts, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. He threw you a morsel. You grabbed it and ran. It didn't take much. For some people, it doesn't take much at all to suck them right in. And they're gone. No hope. Without God and without Christ and lost in the world. That's Satan. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's the devil. The devil is Diablos. He's the tormentor, the, the, the accursed one, the adversary. The Old Testament equivalent of Diablo or devil, the devil is Satan. That's a Hebrew word. It means adversary. He's against you. The Bible said if God be for you, who can be against you? God's for us. Amen. If you have a, if you, the Bible says that we are enemies in our mind if we don't know the Lord. In our mind, we become enemies to God. Have you ever wondered why? Why is, how, how more irrational can somebody be than to be an enemy of God? All he ever wanted was your good. Every prohibition he ever gave you, everything he ever told you not to do is for your good. When God puts up a fence or he puts up a, a, a gate, there's a reason for it. Everything he ever told you was for your benefit and for your good. He even gave us his Bible, his word, the word of God. It's for your good. <coughs> but what does the devil do? He undermines your relationship with God by casting doubt in your mind as to his motive toward you. He wants you to think that God's out to get you. He's not out to get you. If God was out to get you, he'd have got you a long time ago, folks. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. He's not out to get you. The greatest friend you ever had, the Bible said, a friend of sinners. There's no one like him. He wept over Jerusalem. In the mind of God, he knew he would weep over Jerusalem. In the mind of God, he knew they would reject him. Before the foundation of the world, he was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. God knew all these things. He knows all things. He knows the end and the beginning. If he didn't, he wouldn't be God. That's what we called omniscience, all-knowing, all-knowledge, all-knowledge. But he wept. What if you'd been there that night? You've been standing next to the Lord Jesus and heard him weep. You'd thought to yourself, if you were the devil, if you'd been filled with, a, with, with, uh, with spite, you'd say, oh, man, he's weak. That's the way the world figures it today. If you weep, you're weak. No, boy. No, no, no. Let me tell you something. A man that gets up and goes to work and feeds his family and takes care of his children and takes care of his home, he'll weep over his family. He'll weep over his family. It is that cold-hearted flesh eater that cares about nothing but himself or herself that doesn't weep over their family. A man will weep over his children. And a thing I've learned about life is this. You can mess with a lot of things that belong to a daddy, but don't mess with his children. Amen. You can mess with a lot of things that belong to a mama, but don't mess with her children. You know? 
The animal world knows more than we do about a lot of that. Don't mess with a bear cub. You see little cubs out playing, leave them alone. Mama's around somewhere. <laughs> you get in trouble big time. But not today because this nation has destroyed the sanctity of the home, destroyed marriage and what it's all about. You see how often I would have gathered thee as a hen gathereth her chicks. What's he saying? He said, I want to be a father to you. I want to be your daddy. I want to have a relationship with you as a father and a son. And that's a wonderful thing. Most people, the Christians, have a relationship with God where I don't do this, I don't do that. God's not going to get me today. He's not going to get me today. I'm trying my best. I'm doing this. I'm doing. But you're not having, you don't have a relationship with him as a father. He wants to have a relationship with you as a father. This is what Hebrews is talking about. He chastens you as a father. He said, you chasten your children for a prophet here as you understand things to be. But it's a, it's, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, limited chastisement because you don't fully understand exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it. But when God chastens us, he has a goal in mind for our profit, for our profit, and thank God for it. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, I want to show you some places in the Bible that I think are very important. 2 Kings chapter number 20 and verse number 5, the Bible says this, 2 Kings 20 and verse 5, 2 Kings chapter number 20 and verse 5, turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Now, if you don't remember, all of this is in response to verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now you can't possibly understand how Hezekiah felt if you've never been given a death sentence. You can't. You can't. And you're far better off in trying, uh, in not trying to be, um, uh, what's, what's a good word for it? In not trying to be coy about something, cute about it, you know, religious about it. If you've never been given a death sentence, or if you don't really, if you've never been in a position where you didn't, where you thought you were going to die, you don't understand how Hezekiah felt. But Hezekiah was given a death sentence. So what did he do? He turned his face to the wall, and he turned his heart to God, and he began to cry to the Lord, and the tears came up out of his soul, came up out of his heart, the tears, and God saw the tears. He saw the tears. Isn't that amazing? The tear can get the attention of God before the noise and the racket. Amen. The tear can get the attention of God before the power Amen. and the performance. The tear can get the attention of God before the ability. The tear can reach his heart. There's something about the heart of God that just responds to tears. This is why when mothers weep over their children, God hears that because he gives a mother a special place in the heart of her children. Amen. Uh, there's got to be something bad wrong with a mother when the children don't love their mother because it's natural for children to love their mother. And when they don't love their mother, we got a bad problem. we got a big-time problem. So Hezekiah cried out to God. Now, Hezekiah, if you don't know, was a good king. He was one of the good ones. He made a big mistake. He made a big mistake. God added 15 years to his life. And when he added those 15 years to his life, Hezekiah allowed the enemy to come in. He showed him the vessels of the house of God. He showed him what he did, what he did was to show, he, what he did was to put the, put the pearl before the swine and that which is holy before the dog. The dog will never appreciate that which is holy and the swine will never appreciate the pearl. Do not cast your pearls before swine. Give not that which is holy under the dogs. They'll never understand it. They'll never receive it. They'll never understand what you're talking about. He brought the enemy in and showed him the precious things of the house of God where worship was performed, where men loved God, and they did the daily sacrifice and the offering, and he made a mistake in doing that. So Hezekiah was heard because he cried. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter number 33 and verse 27, this is one of my favorite scriptures. I learned this right after I got saved. Deuteronomy 20, 33 and verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge 
and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Look at carefully in verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge. You see, not shifting sand, not man-made, but the eternity of God from everlasting to everlasting, the eternal one. He's stable. He's the anchor of the soul. He's your refuge. Your strength comes in God, folks. Your strength does not come in what He can do for you. Your strength, God, your strength comes in who He is. You've got to put your trust in Him. And the Bible said He knoweth them that put their trust in Him. When I say this is what I mean by that. This is important. This is very important. You'll know. You'll know it the very moment that you have cast your trust upon that eternal being. You'll feel a release in your heart. You'll feel a burden lifted. You'll put it on Him. Live or die, sink or swim, whether I make it or don't make it, you're still God. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah said, we're not going to, said whether we bow or not or burn, it makes no difference. We're not going to bow. And they cast them into that burning, fiery furnace. And when they put them into that furnace, they cast three in there. But when they looked, when they looked, it was that look. Did what? Did not we cast three? Lo, there's a fourth. And the Bible, your Bible says, and his visage is like the who? Not a son of the gods like these new Bibles. The son of God. And he was in there. He'll be in there. He'll always be in there. That's when I got comfort. Because I knew whether I lived or whether I died, it was his choice to make. And that gave me comfort. It wasn't the doctor's choice. It wasn't the choice of medicine. It's not your choice. It was the choice of God. Amen. You do the same thing. God will give you peace. And that's the only way you'll live. To get it from God. Cast yourself upon Him. You're in His hands. He can't do wrong. He can't lie. And He cannot deny Himself. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. Amen. Praise God. So... The everlasting arms. Don't you like that? In Genesis 21 verse 16. This is a sad case. Genesis 21 verse 16. She went, sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. Which is not that far away. Which is a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him, now watch this, and lift up her voice and wept. Now who is her? Who are we talking about here? We're talking about Hagar. Hagar the Egyptian. What's she got to do with Abraham? You remember the story? No child. They brought her in. She became a surrogate mother. And what happened literally was that Sarah, that Hagar sat in the lap of Sarah and had this baby uh, with her, her union with Abraham. And Ishmael was born. Ishmael from day one was a problem because he was a product of the flesh. But here's the point. Hagar never asked for any of this, did she? She was brought into this thing. Hagar was not, uh, you know, she was as innocent as she could possibly be on her part. Hagar was. The Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians that she represents something. She's an allegory. She represents something, you know, far greater than just the person Hagar. He's talking about how that she represents bondage in Jerusalem, which is now, which is in bondage. And it can never receive the promise of God. The promise of God must come through faith. Uh, the, uh, Isaac had to be born through faith. But the point is this, that Hagar did not choose the mess that she got into. She didn't choose that. She was a victim of circumstances. The choice, the choice was made by Sarah and Abraham, not Hagar. And so when this boy had been cast out with her, and of course he wasn't a little baby now. He's something like, uh, what, 13, 14 years old, something like that. <coughs> when he's cast out, she thinks they're going to die. And so she lifts up her voice and she weeps. She's crying for her boy. She's crying for her son that was born and kicked out. And I'm sure she was confused. What have I done wrong? 
I did everything I was supposed to do. I was brought in here. I was a slave. I had a child by this man. And it was their idea to do it. And now here I am, kicked out in the desert. And so she thought she was going to die. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a gracious, merciful God that sees tears. Though she had nothing to do with the promise, she could certainly reap the grace of God. <laughs> Can you see that? She had nothing to do with the promise, but the grace of God reaches far past human ability. And he saved her and preserved her life. He saw the tear. You ever cried like that? You ever been in a situation where nothing works out and you know you're a victim of circumstances? You realize you didn't do anything to get here? Uh, we're not perfect. Listen, we bring, we bring most of the garbage into our lives on our own head. How many agree with that tonight? We do. We do. If you think you're perfect, you've got, you got trouble. You've got big trouble tonight. We bring most of the junk in on our lives. But here and there, we become victims of situations that we have no control over whatsoever. I had no control over my birth. I had no control of the fact that my mother and my father abandoned me, that I was raised by my grandfather. I had no control over that, none whatsoever. <clears throat> but to this day, I love that dear old man that was born in 1878, died in 1969. He became my daddy. What did I do? Well, I can go back and lick my wounds and feel sorry for myself and go around with this uh, complex and, and my childhood and all this psycho babble garbage and pile it on the hair. I can say, God, you've been good to me. You gave me a home. I could have been raised in, a, in John Tarleton or some child home somewhere, but you gave me a home by a loving grandparent. And then you came to me in 1973 and convicted me and saved my soul. Then you called me into the ministry and you gave me something to live for. You've given me a beautiful wife. You've given me a ministry. You've given me something to do. And I know your hand's been in my life. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> we all get kicked down sometimes and stomped when we're down. But God Almighty is merciful and gracious. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I wish I could show you a photograph I'm about this tall. I'm about, I'm about like that. I don't know what I was, two or three years old, little. About like this. My mother is on one side and my father on the other. And here it literally is how I'm standing, like this. I'm holding their hands. Just a little old boy. But I couldn't keep them together. That's what I think of every time I see that photograph. I got my daddy in one hand, my mother in the other. But I couldn't keep them together. Isn't that sad? I encourage you again tonight, if you've got a family, keep it, keep it together. You've got a marriage, make it work, make it work, make it work, make it work. That's how marriages work. You make them work. Well, our marriage is not like their marriage. Forget their marriage. Make your marriage work. You're not married to her. You're not married to him. You're married to the one you're married to. Make it work. That's the key to a happy home and a life. In this world, because no two people are alike and no two marriages are alike. There are certain principles that can be applied to home and marriage, yes. But, my friend, when it comes to yours, you make yours work. I'll hurry up and finish here tonight. Look at 1 Samuel 30 and verse 4. If I preached about all the places in the Bible that talks about weeping, we'd be here till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, so we don't do that. Look at uh, 1 Samuel 30, verse 4. Then David... And the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. You know what's going on here? David and his men had been out in, uh, in, uh, in a raid, war. And when they came back, what did they find? They found their families gone. Now, what was the most important thing to them? It wasn't the booty that they brought back from where they'd been. It was when they came back and their women and their children were gone. And you know what happened, don't you? The men thought about stoning David. And uh, because he was responsible, they held him responsible for it. They lost everything they had. So what did they do? They cried. They wept. They prayed. They called upon God. That's what they did. Do you know what Abraham did when they took Lot back there in the book of Genesis? Do you remember what happened when the kings and the Dale went to... Uh, went to war and, and, uh, they, and the king of Sodom lost and they carried Lot off. They carried him off. What did Abraham do? 
He went after him. He had 318 men, hired men, servants of his house. He went and got him. He went and got him. <coughs> Sometimes you have to be, as they say today, proactive. <laughs> You've got to get involved in what's going on. Sometimes you have to put some legs on your prayers. Sometimes you've got to get serious about your prayer. You've got to, be, you've got to get serious about it. Amen. You've got to get serious about it. Uh, like I've said to you before, I'm trying to prepare you and warn you that if the Muslims come into this country and think they can run wild up and down the streets and start killing Americans, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Some things you don't have to pray about. You've already prayed about it. And, uh, you, you know, that's what you do. You say, well, I'm passive. You won't be passive when they put a knife to your throat. You know, you won't be. You, uh, uh, you will be, uh, you, you, you'll be ready. You'll be ready. And so uh, that's what he did. And that's what you need to do. You know what they're telling people, don't you? They're telling people that they have some of the brightest minds in the world over there with this ISIS that are creating explosives that can be placed on the body where they can go on board an aircraft and it won't be detected. So apparently it doesn't have enough metallic substance in it or whatever is necessary, whatever the, you know, the, the metal detectors or whatever detector they use. Uh, it's able to get through that. And then they'll get you at 35,000 feet and get out in the middle of the aisle and smile at everybody and jerk the cord and you're all gone. That's what happens. Or they'll walk into a mall here in the United States, walk into the middle of a mall, and hear your things packed out at Christmas time, and all the people in here shopping, you know. There'll be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people, like West Town out there, and jerk the cord, or whatever, however they detonate the thing, and start killing people. And sometimes you have to do what you have to do. It'd be wonderful if you had leadership in the country and had, to, and had leadership in the country where people would, uh, people would deal with these, these people the way they need to be dealt with. You know that? It'd be nice if we could resurrect some of those World War II generals. Yes, sir. There was one back there in World War I. His name was, uh, I think they called him Black Jack Pershing. He had to deal with, uh, he had, I think he went over to... Uh, I think he went to the Philippines or somewhere over in there and had to deal with the, with the, uh, with the, with the Muslim uprising. And uh, he had to deal with it. Our history teacher back there. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. 60 or 70,000. Yeah. And what did they call those uh, fanatics that were back up in the woods? They had a term that we use today, and I forget what it's called. There was a term like... Uh, I remember when I was a boy, they used to use that term, like somebody's gone completely crazy and screaming mad. But anyway, here's what they say Pershing did. Pershing, if he captured 20 or 30 of them, uh, whatever, uh, he would kill them all but one. And then he would wrap pig skins around all that he killed and sent the one back to the rest of them and told them what he did how he dealt with them. You see, when he wrapped the pig skins around them, it kept them from going to paradise. And they couldn't get up through their 70 virgins. Amen. That's not very politically correct. That's good. Now, some say that really didn't happen, but I've read quite a bit on both. But here's the point. It stopped. Yeah. That's what they, understand. they understood that. That's the key, brother. They understood it. They don't understand... They don't, when you go over there and bow down to the king of Saudi Arabia and try to be nice to these people, they don't understand that. The only thing they understand is if when they're looking down the barrel of your gun, the barrel of your gun is bigger than the barrel of their gun. That's the only thing they understand. The only thing they understand. So uh, if you love your family and you love your children, you'll be vigilant and you'll be watching and you'll be praying. And by the grace of God, you will. And that's what you're going to have to do. It's a shame we live in that age, but we live in the age right before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's about to come back. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll close with this one. If you look at Genesis 43 and verse number 30, we read these words. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep. And he entered into his chamber and wept there. Boy. 
Isn't that amazing? Now, who's he weeping over? When he talks about his brother, you know, Joseph, you know a little bit about the history of, the history of Israel. Who? <laughs> That's right. And who was their mother? Rachel. She died in, on the way to uh, Ephrata, giving birth to Benjamin and uh, Bethlehem Ephrata. And they have to a tomb over there right now, Rachel's tomb. And when Jewish women who are barren and they want to have children, they will go to the tomb of Rachel and they'll pray for God to open their womb so that they can have children because it's deeply ingrained in Jewish history that God opened the womb of Rachel. Remember? Leah had one right after another, after another, after another, and Bildad and, 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 and what was the other one? So far, uh, they had uh, the, the concubines, one after another, after another, after another, and Rachel had no children. But who was Rachel's firstborn? Joseph. Joseph. Coat of many colors. That's right. And then the lastborn, Benjamin. Benjamin. And she died in giving birth to Benjamin. Yeah. So Benjamin was Joseph's brother. They had the same mother. All of the other brothers were half-brothers because, you know, they had all had the same daddy, but they had different mothers. So Joseph had a special love for Benjamin. He had a special love for him. And when he saw that boy, there's no doubt in my mind that he, that he his brother, reminded him of his mother. And he had been taken from his family when he was a teenager and had spent all those years out in Egypt. But he got to see his brother, his full blood brother, and he loved him and his heart opened up and the tears flowed from his soul. There was a connection there. There's a connection there that you can't break. It's a wonderful thing. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is part and parcel of us. Or let's say it this way. We're part and parcel of him. And the scripture calls him our elder brother. And we all have the, and we have the same father. My father and the father of the Lord Jesus Christ is the same father, God the Father. Now be careful. I'm not trying to pull him down to my level and make him just another human being. Not at all. But you see, your relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ is a multifaceted thing. You are a son of God by the new birth. At the moment you were born again, you became a son of God. But that puts you in the family of God. When you became a son of God, that puts you in the family of God. And the family of God means that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and all of us who are born again, and all of the Old Testament saints, and all of the saints before the flood, and all of the saints in the future that come out of the millennium and come out of the tribulation period, all the saints that were under the law, all the saints that were under promise, all of the dispensations down through the ages, they're all part of the family of God. But there's only one bride, just one bride. That's his church. That's his body. That's who we are. That bride started 2,000 years ago, and it will be consummated when the last one is born again into the body of Christ. And he's coming back for his bride, a bridegroom coming for his bride. So the many ways that I'm related to the Lord Jesus Christ, many ways, many different ways, the most important way is that he is my Lord and my Savior and my God through the new birth. But he's also my elder brother because we are of the same Father and the family of God. We belong to the same Father. He loves me like he loves a brother. In other words, like Joseph loved Benjamin, Christ loves you. I want to ask you this question when I come to a close tonight. Do you love him like he loves you? Yeah, amen. Do you? You see, that's the most important thing. If it's pure love and selfless love where you love him, that is the most, that's the most, that's the purest form. That's the purest form of the grace of God working in your heart is when you love him like he loves you. It is, because you have absolutely, there's, no, there's absolutely no personal, there's nothing in it personal for you. There's nothing to gain. You're just returning your love to him. And that's a wonderful thing. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said tonight for the glory of God. Bless my brothers and my sisters.
Bless those gathered together in this house. Bless those who watch by the internet. Bless those who will watch it later or hear it. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake we ask it. And amen.